Hola de vuelta, ¿cómo están? Eh, <risa> les, la siguiente clase es The Artistic Genius of Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo. Entonces va a ser una clase similar con el profesor Dennis Bodden, que es experta en renacimiento de Columbia University y Rogers University. Espero disfruten. Well, I want to thank One Day University for inviting me here today and giving me the opportunity, oh my goodness, to talk about not one complicated topics, but what really is now three complicated topics. Because I have to talk to you about Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and the nature of their genius. And I want you to know that rarely can I get through any one of these topics in an hour, so I got 65 minutes. I'm going to do my best. Now, the best place to start when we want to talk about genius is the Italian Renaissance, at least when it comes to art history. Do you know, it's a fascinating thing, we know more artists' names who were born in the 15th century than we do the entire history of the world up until that point. But to only a scant few do we give the title of genius. And mostly when we think about genius, we think about Leonardo da Vinci and his younger contemporary, Michelangelo Bonarotti. Um, they are notable, I will say, also because of the fact that these are artists that remain in our consciousness even today. I do an experiment on my very first day of the class every semester, and I tell my students to pull out their phones. 95% of them have their phones out already at that moment. And I tell them to set up a Google News Alert, choose the artist they're most interested in, and set it up so that every time that artist appears in the news, they're going to get an email. Right? It's something I've been doing for years. That's how I follow the news on Leonardo and Michelangelo. I used to do Raphael, but there's a lot of soccer when you put in Raphael. <laughs> so, and I will tell you, there are days that my email looks something like this. Now this, oh, by the way, this is an amazing thing. First of all, okay, there's an occasional Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie and an occasional restaurant review because you would not imagine how many restaurants out there are named Michelangelo. But besides that, it is amazing that we're talking about two artists who died in the 16th century who are in the news almost daily. Now, if you look at the news, Leonardo is outpacing Michelangelo right now um, because this is the year that we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's death, right, in 2019. But in my inbox right now are new discoveries for these artists, new things. We like to find out new things about their personalities, about their temperaments, about their abilities, but we love new discoveries of objects. We're always searching for more. So right now in my inbox there is a news article about this terracotta clay little statuette that someone has proposed as an original Michelangelo model for his Roman Pietà. There is this smiling Madonna and child, which has long been known in a British collection, but somebody just decided that it's by Leonardo, and it's actually on view as a Leonardo right now in Florence, where I took that picture about two weeks ago. But as I said, we have been ramping up Leonardo discoveries especially because we are coming close to this anniversary. So I like to keep track sometimes about all the new objects we find. And these are my new, here's, here's the last few years. Paintings, sculptures, drawings. Now listen, there's a motivation for this. Um, even if you don't follow Leonardo in the news the way that I do, you'd be hard pressed not to have noticed a very big story that's been in the news about Leonardo since about 2017, having to do with this picture. Right? The so-called Salvador Mundi, it's a small painting of a half-length blessing figure of Christ, and it is incredibly problematic. By that I mean it is one of several versions of an almost identical composition, and the picture is in exceptionally poor condition. It has been known, it's not a new discovery, it's been known for decades, but it always had been attributed not to Leonardo, but to a member of his workshop, one of his followers. But about a decade ago, the picture was, I don't know, pulled out of storage somewhere. Somebody bought it for a few thousand dollars. They brought some key art historians on board. They cleaned it a lot. And they rebranded it as an authentic Leonardo. 
And it went up for sale at auction, where it sold for an astounding, record-breaking $450 million. Now, mind you, if it was a member of Leonardo's workshop, the most that they could have expected to get was about $750,000. So it's a pretty good profit. Um, as soon as this purchase was made, it, would, it was announced that the painting was going to hang side by side with the Mona Lisa. It was made, it, would, it, it was announced that, that the, the painting, painting was going to hang side, side by side with the Mona Lisa. On the page, it looked nothing. The beginning simple, almost comic. Just a pulse, bassoons, basset horns. Like a rusty squeeze box. Well, I want to thank One Day University for inviting me here today and giving me the opportunity, oh my goodness, to talk about not one complicated topics, but what really is now three complicated topics. Because I have to talk to you about Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and the nature of their genius. And I want you to know that rarely can I get through any one of these topics in an hour, so I got 65 minutes. I'm going to do my best. Now, the best place to start. of Christ, and it is incredibly problematic. By that I mean it is one of several versions of an almost identical composition, and the picture is in exceptionally poor condition. It has been known, it's not a new discovery, it's been known for decades, but it always had been attributed not to Leonardo, but to a member of his workshop, one of his followers. But mm, about a decade ago, the picture was, I don't know, pulled out of storage somewhere. Somebody bought it for a few thousand dollars. They brought some key art historians on board. They cleaned it a lot. And they rebranded it as an authentic Leonardo. And it went up for sale at auction, where it sold for an astounding, record-breaking $450 million. Now, mind you, if it was a member of Leonardo's workshop, the most that they could have expected to get was about $750,000. So it's a pretty good profit. Um, as soon as this purchase was made, it, would, it was announced that the painting was going to hang side by side with the Mona Lisa at a big blockbuster exhibition at the Louvre um, scheduled for this year. But I mean, the news has been funny since then. The painting went missing, no one could find it. Someone was suspecting it was a grand money laundering scheme. And the Louvre actually just rescinded their offer to show the picture because of doubts about its authenticity. So right there, that is the sound of, what, $449.25 million disappearing. So this is important. Now, this is why we think about these artists today. We have a sort of current context for them. But the thing is, both Leonardo and Michelangelo were considered divine geniuses in their own time. And to a large extent, that's because we considered these artists to be what we call universal men artists who are skilled in multiple disciplines. This is, by the way, especially true of Michelangelo, who was a sort of universal man in practice. By that, I mean that he was a painter who worked in the diverse media of sculpture and on panel. He was a sculptor who worked in marble and bronze, in relief and in the round. He was an architect who designed, among other things, the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. And he was a city planner. I mean, he de designed one of the most famous piazzas in ancient and modern Rome. By the way, this only represents a fraction of his work. And on top of that, we can add about 300 sonnets and a few hundred drawings, despite the fact that shortly before his death, he ordered all of them to be burned. More on that later. Now, Leonardo is a lot more difficult. Um, Leonardo was a theoretician. You know, he always was planning on writing books, but he doesn't actually publish any of them. He was a painter who didn't paint very much, and he's a sculptor for whom we really probably don't have any sculpture despite that smiling Madonna. Uh, he is an architect who didn't build any buildings. So listen, he mostly considered himself a painter. And if you're generous, 
This is about what we could say Leonardo paints during the course of his career. He lives to be 67 years old. That is not a huge body of work. If you're a skeptic, and guess what? I'm a skeptic, and you take away those works for which we don't have secure attributions and which are very problematic, we can get it down to about a dozen. By the way, out of these, one of them is a collaboration, several are unfinished, and the rest are in exceptionally poor condition. So, how do we go about even thinking about these artists together? And so, I came up with an interesting place to start, to think about how they thought about art. And I started by thinking about two different variants on this theme of the Holy Family. Now, why did I think of these two? Interestingly, both of these were painted when the artists were 31 years old. Each was 31 at the time they painted. Nice early point in their careers, um, though you'll notice that the dates of these two are very different. Okay, I have a question. Is there any chance of getting the lights down in this room? Sorry, it's behind my head. <laughs> okay, well, good luck with Leonardo, sorry. Mm, squint at it. Okay. Um, in any case, so these are both works from a very early place in their career. You'll notice that Michelangelo's is quite a bit later. He was born a full 23 years after Leonardo was. But let's take a look. You know, at 31, Leonardo was a late bloomer. So at 31, he had accomplished very little. At that point, there were very few finished works to his name. Um, when at this time, he moved to the city of Milan and he was contracted by um, the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception in the Church of San Francesco Grande to paint the central panel of an altarpiece. It is a perfect work for looking at how Leonardo thought about what painting should be. In a word, Leonardo thought painting should be everything. Everything that could be seen. And the painter was supposed to be master of all of those things. Now, Leonardo, we know quite a lot about what he thought about painting because he wrote it all down. He had, yay, he had this intention that he would write a treatise on the art of painting, which he never publishes. It gets published posthumously. But here he gives us some ideas of what a painter should be. And he says this, he says that a painter is not admirable unless he is universal. Some may distinctly assert that those persons are under a delusion who call that painter a good master, who can do nothing well but a head or a figure. Certainly, this is no great achievement. After studying one single thing for a lifetime, who would not have attained some perfection in it? But since we know that painting embraces and includes in itself every object produced by nature or resulting from the fortuitous actions of men, in short, all that the eye can see, he seems to be but a poor master who can not only do a figure well. For do you not perceive how many and various actions are performed by men only, how many different animals there are, as well as trees, plants, flowers, with many mountainous regions and plains, springs and rivers, cities with public and private buildings, machines too, fit for the purposes of men, diverse costumes, decorations, and arts? All of these ought to be regarded as of equal importance and value by the man who can be termed a good painter. It's a tall order. This picture, though, it's an early work. It shows this sort of interdisciplinary way that Leonardo thought. For example, geologists have written on this picture, noting that you can specifically identify different types of rock formations that he draws. We can see Leonardo's interest in optics and the mechanics of vision when he draws this sort of atmospheric perspectival view where he shows how forms lose their definition and their chromatic identity as they move into the distance. You'll notice also here all of the plant formations around this. Um, and you can see them as well in the foreground where I tried to blow them up a little bit. And they are like scientific botanical illustrations, identifiable by type. I'm no good with plants, by the way. I kill everything I see. I think that's cyclamen, and this is Jacob's Ladder. You can see it here, and you could see the irises, among dozens of other plants. If we step back and look at the figures, we also see Leonardo's interest in anatomy. And this is an interest that he fostered his whole life. 
so much so that we believe that he dissected about 30 bodies over the course of his lifetime, at a time when that was not really looked on well by the church. Leonardo didn't care about that. Um, you know, we're sometimes tough on Leonardo as an anatomist. I put up a little detail here of the blessing Christ child next to one of his drawings. And this is a drawing that gets picked on mightily for Leonardo because people say that it's, it's an incorrect drawing here. He's trying to draw the human fetus. But Leonardo, you know, he was smart and he pulled his knowledge from every source he could find it. So you know what he did? He read ancient texts about anatomy. And when he could dissect bodies, he tried to match that up. And when he couldn't get a body, he used comparative anatomy. So here, as he's trying to draw this human fetus, he's using a newborn child. And he couldn't get a woman to dissect, so it's a bovine uterus, right? But he's putting together what he knows. And the truth of it is, because of his scientific knowledge and his skill as an artist, his anatomical drawings are as good as or better than most of the period. And the only reason we don't recognize him as a chief anatomist of the time was because he always knew that there was more to know, so he never publishes any of it. So we get some sense of this idea of how much the artist needs to know. And then it's interesting to put this side by side with Michelangelo. Now again, this is 23 years later, when Michelangelo paints a picture that we call the Doni Tondo. Um, by the way, at 31, whereas Leonardo had not done very much yet, Michelangelo was quite famous, but only as a sculptor. And this is probably his only surviving painting on panel. Right? It's what we call a tondo, it's a round painting, and he, we call it the Doni Tondo because he paints it for this guy. His name is Agnolo Doni, who, I can't decide if he's a very brilliant patron of the arts or not so smart. It's a little bit of both. Um, he's quite smart in that he was an early collector of both Raphael and Michelangelo, which is pretty notable, but he will go down in history as the man who bargained poorly with Michelangelo. There's a great story about this, and it gives you a little bit of insight into Michelangelo's character. So, um, Agnolo commissions this picture probably for the birth of a child, right? And so Michelangelo finishes the painting, and he sends via messenger the painting over to Donny to collect the payment of 60 ducats that they had agreed upon and to turn over the picture. So Agnolo Donny thinks he's sly, and he sends 40 ducats back to Michelangelo thinking that that would be enough for the painter. And he's wrong. So Michelangelo is not very happy. He sends his messenger back to Donnie with the 40 ducats, saying that now he has to pay him 100 ducats or return the picture. So Agnolo Donnie realizes that he's made a mistake. And so he sends the original 60 ducats that was the price of the picture to Michelangelo, thinking that would solve the problem. And he was wrong. So, Finally, Michelangelo sends back a request for 140 ducats for him bargaining one last time, and Donnie finally acquiesces and he pays the price and probably learns a really valuable lesson in the meantime. So this is a much more traditional holy family. You know, we have uh, the Virgin Mary holding this sort of Herculean Christ child on her shoulder with a Joseph behind her. And then in the middle distance behind a low wall, we see a young St. John the Baptist, and behind that, further in the distance, we see five muscular male nudes, enigmatic. We've been debating the meaning of these naked men for the last century or more. So it's interesting, though, to think about what Michelangelo and Leonardo think about painting. It's hard for Michelangelo because he was not a theorist. He did not want to write a treatise on art or any such thing. But there is a 16th century source that records supposedly a dialogue with Michelangelo. This guy named Francisco de Holanda, he's a Portuguese painter, publishes this text. And in the text, Michelangelo is talking about Flemish painting, that is painting from Northern Europe. And here's what he says, I love this. It gives you a little bit of insight of how differently these guys think. He says, in Flanders they paint with a view to deceiving sensual vision, such things as may cheer you and of which you cannot speak ill. They paint stuffs and masonry, the green grass of the fields, the shadows of trees and rivers and bridges, which they call landscapes, with many figures on this side and many figures on that. And all of this, though it pleases some persons, is done without reason or art, 
without symmetry or proportion, without skillful selection or boldness, and finally without substance or vigor. Nevertheless, there are countries where they paint worse than in Flanders. <laughs> And I do not speak so ill of Flemish painting because it is all bad, but because it attempts to do so many things well, each one of which would suffice for greatness, that it does none well. So you see a very different idea. Leonardo arguing for the universality of the painter and Michelangelo arguing for reduction. It's actually quite an interesting idea. We're going to talk a little bit today about, obviously, all day about comparing. And in the Renaissance, there was this idea called the paragone. And it was literally this sort of debate comparing different disciplines. It, it, it existed since antiquity. In the Renaissance, they liked to compare which was better, painting or sculpture. Leonardo argues for painting because of what he says. Painting can do everything. He saw it as an intellectual pursuit, not a manual labor of banging on rocks. Now, Michelangelo, on the other hand, he saw paint sculpture as superior, and the reason that he did is because he says that a sculpture is poor if it's like a painting, but a painting is better if it's like a sculpture. And you can look at his art and you see this sculptural interest in Michelangelo. It's about focusing on the human figure and creating this realistic three-dimensional form. If you look at the two artists together, you know, Leonardo's botanical studies, Michelangelo has no such interest. The ground is a wash of green, a couple sprigs of grass, a little punch of clover. If we look into the background of the picture, we saw Leonardo's atmospheric perspective. Here we just see patches of green and blue to suggest distance, none of this interest in geology or in vision. For Michelangelo, it was all about the hue. That was the one thing he was planning on doing well, right? Um, he, like Leonardo, is a student of anatomy. And somehow, he convinced the prior of the Church of Santo Spirito to let him have bodies. There was a hospital attached to the church. And Michelangelo, from the time he was a teenager, was apparently dissecting bodies in the crypt, again, at a time when the church frowned on such things. But let's go back to the beginning a little bit, because we're going to see some similar beats in the lives of these artists. First of all, we think of them both as being essentially Florentine by nature. Neither one of them is born in the city of Florence. Leonardo is born about 20 miles to the west um, in the small hill town of Vinci, from where he gets his name. Uh, Michelangelo's born in a smaller, hillier town, <laughs> about 60 miles to the east of Florence, called Caprese, which can I honestly tell you the best porcini? I don't remember anything about Caprese, except it was the best porcini mushrooms I've ever had in my life. And someday I'm going back for them. Um, and by the way, we now call this Caprese Michelangelo, because that's what they got going for them, and the mushrooms. That's it. Um, Michelangelo was born in Caprese because his dad had a very short-term government post there at the time that Michelangelo was born. So shortly after he's born, he's brought back to Florence. Um, Leonardo, on the other hand, spends the first five years of his life in Vinci, he, being raised by his father and his grandfather, who were notaries. And they bring him to Florence in about 1457. And Florence must have been an amazing place for an artist to be growing up at this time. A city of about 40,000 people, dominated by the newly constructed cathedral, the Duomo, which was just recently finished. But honestly, it's a great example to think about how they thought about genius in the Renaissance. I love this idea. So when the cathedral was begun, it was 1296, and they planned a building that was so large in its footprint, and they start building such thin walls that they had no conceivable way of putting a dome on the building. Right? In other words, they created a seemingly impossible engineering challenge with the idea that man would find a way. I mean, that's the hope in man's genius, right? It took until 1418 for a sculptor turned architect named Filippo Brunelleschi to solve the problem of the dome. And at the time that the young Leonardo is in Florence, he was witnessing the final touches on the lantern at the very top. But Florence also, for both of these artists, meant opportunity. Right? Um, the city itself was a major economic center of both the silk and wool production. It was also a banking center. In fact, the Florentine coin, the florin, was the first universally accepted gold currency in use in Europe since the 8th century. So Florence is something of a center. 
And in the time of the use of both of these artists, the sort of de facto ruler of the city was a man named Lorenzo de' Medici, Lorenzo the Magnificent, they called him, who was more or less running the city from about 1469 to 1492. His grandfather, Cosimo, had constructed an enormous palace right in the heart of the city near the cathedral, um, where he created a huge humanist court full of scholars. And it only was growing in the middle of the 15th century because of the fall of Constantinople. And it sent all of the great Greek scholars into exile, some of which landed in Florence. So it was a rich time for them to be there. And both Leonardo and Michelangelo found their artistic training in Florence. Now, for Leonardo, this was one issue. See. His father and his grandfather were both notaries. They were in a legal profession. But Leonardo's father, Ser Piero, never married his mother, Caterina. So Leonardo was illegitimate. And that precluded him from following his father into his profession. So Ser Piero was more than happy to put his illegitimate son into the workshop of a sculptor and sometimes painter, a man named Andrea del Verrocchio. Um, Leonardo stayed there. Actually, he entered kind of late. He's a late bloomer. But he actually stays there not only for his training in the arts of painting and sculpture, but he remains there for quite a period of time, even as a collaborator to Verrocchio. It's a little bit of a different story for Michelangelo, because Michelangelo's father had this notion that the family was like old aristocracy way back in the past. And Michelangelo knew that too. And so he was not so happy with his son being in this sort of labor kind of profession that art was considered to be. And so reluctantly, when Michelangelo was 13 years old, he put him into the workshop of a very famous painter named Domenico Ghirlandaio. Michelangelo lasted one year. Which, by the way, that's a fraction of how long you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be in a workshop for five or six years. He lasts one. And then he leaves, and he never has a good word to say about this man. So he decides to teach himself to paint. I mean, what better place than Florence? So Michelangelo did what a lot of artists did. They went and they visited these fantastic chapels that were painted around the city. And so for example, we know that Michelangelo went to see these paintings showing scenes from the life of St. John the Evangelist in the Peruzzi Chapel of Santa Croce, painted by Giotto. And the young Michelangelo would make drawings after the figures. You know, he was particularly attracted to Giotto because he was such a sculptural painter. And then he could cross the Arno, where he wound, found himself in the Brancacci Chapel, where there were frescoes by Masaccio, including this slightly cropped image of the tribute money. And here you can see him again, choosing an artist that is sculptural in his bent and copying and even sort of exaggerating the sculptural nature of the drapery. By the way, it's in the Brancacci Chapel. If you ever see an image of Michelangelo, you notice he has a broken nose. He gets his nose broken here. He's in the Brancacci Chapel as a young man, as a teenager, and he gets into a debate with another artist, this guy named Pietro Torrigiani. And Pietro Torrigiani later recounts the event, and he said that Bonarotti was teasing people, and on this day, he aggravated him more than usual. And he said he gave him such a hard punch in the nose that he felt the bone and cartilage give way as if it were sponge cake. And thus marked by me, he'll remain for the rest of his life. So there's where we get that. It also tells you maybe something else about Michelangelo's personality. But both Leonardo and Michelangelo, as young men, also start frequenting the Medici Sculpture Garden. So the Medici family, right down the street from their palace, over adjacent to the church of San Marco, which was also patronized by the Medici, there was an outdoor garden. I think it's now a flower shop. I'm not sure. There's a bus stop there. Um, this is a place where the Medici kept their, their collection of antiquities. And it was a place where artists tended to gather. And this would have been valuable for Michelangelo, because he could go around and look at you know, these religious paintings on the walls. But this was an opportunity for him not only to engage with sculpture, but to engage with the classical past. So we don't know what the garden looked like. We imagine it looks something like this. This is a 16th century sculpture courtyard in Rome. But this is probably where Michelangelo first starts to learn to sculpt. I will say something. Michelangelo would never admit that anybody taught him anything. That's his personality. So he studied with Ghirlandaio. He taught me nothing. And even though he was hanging out in the sculpture garden with these famous older masters, he said that they didn't teach him either. Do you know how Michelangelo learned to sculpt? <laughs> 
according to Michelangelo, breast milk. So, no joke. When Michelangelo was a young man, okay, he was a baby, right? Very often, babies were sent outside of the city of Florence to wet nurses in the sort of hillside. And one of these towns is the town of Settignano, which had a whole lot of sculptures. And Michelangelo was nursed by a woman who was the wife of a stonecutter and the daughter of a stonecutter. And so Michelangelo later said that he drank in the hammer and chisels with his wet nurse's <laughs> breast milk. Okay, so they're both, both young Leonardo and less young Leonardo and young Michelangelo are hanging out in this Medici garden. And while Michelangelo is learning to carve, Leonardo finds another kind of opportunity. He comes into contact with Lorenzo the Magnificent and Lorenzo of all things sends Leonardo on a diplomatic mission of sorts. He sends Leonardo to the city of Milan where he asks Leonardo to present the Duke of Milan with a lyre, stringed musical instrument. Leonardo, among everything else, was a musician. Um, he actually wrote that painting and music were sister arts, although he said that painting was superior because, because music dissipates the moments after it's made. So painting, because of its longevity, was superior. So Leonardo goes to Milan, and he is excited by what he sees. You see, the thing about Florence is that artists were sort of contracted piecemeal. Like, I hire you for a job and you get paid. The artists would get paid for material and time. They would hand over the work, the contract was over, and they could get hired again. But when Leonardo goes to Milan, he sees the idea of the court artist. Right? The court artist was on salary and had time to experiment. So he comes home and he starts drafting a letter to Ludovico Sforza, who was the future Duke of Milan. He was currently acting as like a regent. And some people call it a job application letter. I think of it as like Leonardo's sort of like answer to his imagined wish list of what Ludovico wants. Unfortunately, you know what Ludovico needs at that moment? A military engineer. That's what he needs because Milan is becoming embroiled in the war of Ferrara. So what does Leonardo do? He writes a letter that he's a military engineer. Now, okay, I'm gonna show you a whole lot of words here. I'll show you what's important. It's a long letter. But Leonardo gives this list of 10 items of all the things he can do for the Duke. I will start by saying out of the first nine, he has no experience in these things that we know of. I have these vague flashbacks to the first time my boss ever asked me to do something on a fax machine, my age, on a fax machine. And I was like, okay, and I got to the fax machine. I was like, mm, I don't know how to do this. But he writes this fantastic letter. Here are all the things that he can do. And they include, in short, he can build light, strong, and easily portable bridges. By the way, the bridges could be lifted up and moved as the enemy approached. He could destroy fortresses of every kind. He could make cannon. He could make covered assault vehicles, basically. And you know, by the way, all of these things, he will eventually make drawings for all of these ideas. And we can see some of them here. You know, this one I love. Here's his war machine, which is a chariot pulled rotating sift to cut up bodies on the battlefield. We've got the four man armored tank. And this one, which might be my favorite because it's the enormous revolving crossbow, but it's like a giant hamster wheel that the people, you know, they climb on it and they turn the four different crossbows rotate. So this is what he says he can do for the Duke. I can do all of these things. It's only when you get to item number 10 that we start to come across things that Leonardo might be able to do. He says that he can, he's an architect. He says that he can also make sculpture in marble, bronze, and clay. Likewise, he can paint. That's like the last thing that he says. Well, that's not true. There's one thing he says very, very last, and it's very, very important. And he says this, moreover, work could be undertaken on the bronze horse, which will be to the immortal glory and eternal honor of the auspicious memory of his lordship, your father, and of the illustrious house of Sforza. This is why Leonardo wanted to go to Milan. See, I, you know, the reason I told you about the cathedral earlier on is because there is this idea in the Renaissance that I love about genius, and it's about setting up the seemingly impossible challenge and finding a solution. And so Leonardo, what he wants to do is make an equestrian monument. 
Now, equestrian monuments were everywhere in ancient Rome where they were this paramount image of military authority, the ruler on horseback. But since the fall of ancient Rome, there were really not that many of them made. They were expensive and they were technically very difficult. Right? And then, by the way, they were expensive in terms of medium, because it's bronze, and also to do, to cast. So that form, like many other things, was being revived in the Renaissance. So in the middle of the century, Donatello, the very famous sculptor, he created an equestrian man monument to this general named Erasmo de Narni. We call him the Gatta Malata. It's in Padua. And then at the very moment that Leonardo wrote his letter, he, his own master, was planning an equestrian monument. So Verrocchio was planning a monument to the Bartolomeo Colleoni. This is in Venice. So here's an idea, though. Leonardo, the Duke must have accepted his offer. And he heads to Milan, and he begins this project with tremendous ambition. Here's an example. So Donatello's Gatta Malata, horse and rider together, a very realistic 11 feet tall. Verrocchio, horse and rider together, it has to be better, right? 13 feet tall. Leonardo begins to plan the horse. He doesn't even think about the rider, by the way, who is the Duke's father. Forget that. He just starts working on the horse. And he plans that the horse is going to be 24 feet high. <laughs> so this is what Leonardo does. He starts with this ridiculously ambitious idea of what he could do, which, by the way, we still don't know how to do. Um, but you know, maybe the Duke would have been happy if Leonardo got right to work. But remember, Leonardo thinks art is everything. So Leonardo instead started to fill pages in his notebooks of things to do and things to learn. Even though Leonardo insisted he wasn't a man of letters, he began to teach himself Latin. This, by the way, puts every to-do list you've ever written to shame. <laughs> this is one of his to-do lists, and it's one of my favorite things he's ever written, OK? Because it gives you some insight into his mind. So first, it has a large list of um, books he needs to get. At a time without that many centralized libraries, he needed to know who had it and who could lend him one. And there are books on algebra, on churches, on proportion, on celestial phenomena, mathematics, and hydraulics. Also on the list are the people he needs to talk to. Experts in every possible field. People who are studying fortifications and mathematics. Um, this is my favorite. He has a notation to remind himself to talk to Benedetto Portinari, who's the head of one of the branches of the Medici Bank in the north, to ask them how they go on ice in Flanders. He's asking about ice skates. Right, that's on his to-do list. The rest of the list is about an ambitious project to map the city of Milan. So all of these things are keeping him busy and driving his patron crazy. So much so that finally, by 1489, Leonardo has done nothing on this horse. And Ludovico has his agent, his ambassador in Florence, write a letter to Lorenzo the Magnificent saying, can you get me another artist? Right? He says here at the end, let's see, although he has given the commission to Leonardo da Vinci, he appears to me to be far from satisfied that the sculptor is equal to the task. So Leonardo gets to work. He begins a book, of course, because there's always a book. He begins a book on how to make the horse. He begins to study different ways to compose the monument. He starts to hang out at the ducal stables, where he makes careful measurements of every part of the horse's anatomy. And he begins to try to figure out this impossible task of how he's actually going to cast a 24-foot tall horse in a single piece minus the tail. And so here you can see this fantastic drawing where he's designing the armature that's going to go around the clay model. And here, where he's trying, this is great, he's trying to figure out how he's going to dig a pit to put the model into it so that he could pour in the bronze. But every time he tests it out, the horse is so big, it hits the water table and ruins the mold. <laughs> so Leonardo, though, he works hard. And by 1493, he's got a clay model of a 24-foot high horse at which point the worst happens, which is that Milan goes to war with the French. And Ludovico had allocated 70 tons of bronze to Leonardo for this project. But he takes it all back and gives it over to the foundry to make cannon. 
So by the time we're in the early 1490s, things are not going that well for Leonardo. <laughs> They're not going that well for Michelangelo either. Um, like Michelangelo, like Leonardo, was hanging around the sculpture garden, and he too befriends Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, Lorenzo, Lorenzo really takes a liking to Michelangelo, and by all accounts, Michelangelo becomes like a member of the Medici household for a few years, where he gets to associate with great thinkers and humanists. One of the Medici children was exactly his age. Um, like that, they're like teenagers. They all look like that to me now, little teenagers running around. But they were exactly the same age. That was gonna grow, he was gonna grow up to be the future Pope Leo X. Right, so this is Michelangelo's world. But when he's 17 years old, Lorenzo the Magnificent dies. And he is replaced by his son, Piero di Lorenzo, who he, we call him the Magnificent. This is Piero the Unfortunate. <laughs> no joke, that is this poor man's name. So Piero the Unfortunate, he only rules for two years before he gets ousted, like the Medici family gets kicked out of Florence. And those were not a terribly good two years for Michelangelo. And supposedly the only thing he ever commissions from Michelangelo was a snowman during an especially big Florentine snowstorm. So when the Medici fall, Michelangelo leaves Florence. He goes first to Bologna very briefly, and then he makes a brief return to Florence where he sculpts a statue of a sleeping Cupid. This, by the way, is not Michelangelo's, or maybe it is, we don't know. We've lost the sleeping Cupid. But this is an ancient type of sculpture. There were many of these made in ancient Rome. Um, and Michelangelo makes one of these, and it is seen by a dealer, this guy named Baldessare. And Baldessare says, hey, Michelangelo, you know, if you bury that in the ground and dig it back up, it'll look ancient. And Baldessare takes the statue to Rome, where he sells it to a cardinal for 200 ducats, pays Michelangelo like 30, right? But he sells it for 200 ducats. It works for a while, but somehow the cardinal gets wind of what happened, of the deception, and he returns the money. He gets his money back, he returns the statue. But he invites Michelangelo to Rome. And so Michelangelo goes to Rome, where he starts working for another dealer, this guy named Jacopo Galli. And Galli asks Michelangelo to make a statue of a Bacchus. Now, Bacchus, this particular statue, is incredibly important. Because as far as I know, it is one of the earliest life-size nudes of a classical subject that was made in the Renaissance. It's a big deal, it's actually over life size. An image of Bacchus, right, the ancient god of wine and sort of vegetation. And it is a really spectacular image because we see Bacchus with this sort of drunken state. He's in an unstable pose, he's got the unfocused gaze. Um, we know, by the way, that it's Bacchus. Michelangelo made him very readable. We can see his grapes adorning his hair. And as we move around the statue, we can see the little satyr that's there to prop him up, nibbling on more grapes and embracing with his arm this sort of panther skin that we see trailing onto the bottom of the rock. It was an incredibly ambitious sculpture. It's one that sometimes people overlook because we're not sure what to make of it. Um, the, unsteady, the unsteady pose of the figure is particularly notable. First of all, because sculpture needs to be stable. Inherently, sculpture has issues of balance. So to make this figure with this ungainly pose was quite a feat. But it's also a sculpture that you need to move around, right? So if you look at it from the front, we have the best view of Bacchus's face. As we move around the side, we get the view of that little satyr coming in. From the back, we see the back. <laughs> but we can also then see the face of that panther skin trailed onto the ground. But when you walk around the statue all the way to the left, you get this view, which is really problematic and confusing. And it's hard to imagine Michelangelo intended a view to look like that. So what happened? Why does he do it? There are two pieces of evidence from the 16th century which give us a clue. One of them is a print that was made in the you know, 1530s, and you can see the statue of Bacchus in Jacopo Galli's sculpture garden. And the other one is a drawing by another artist who clearly is interested in studying the anatomy, okay? And so like, what do they have in common? What happened? It's the hand, right? 
The hand is missing in both of the works. And it's really interesting. It's hard to imagine what kind of trauma could have happened to this statue where it wouldn't have broken off that very fragile head, but it would have taken off entirely Bacchus's right hand, as well as, by the way, his penis, which is missing as well. Um, so like, what happens to the statue? And there's really one super logical answer, which is that Michelangelo never made a hand for it. Michelangelo made it as a purposeful fragment. Why? Because he was trying to make an antique, right? So, um, you know, there's other evidence of this. If you look at the base of the statue around the back where there's that panther head, do you see these little dots? They're sort of pronounced in the eyes. Those are made with a, um, a bow drill, which is how artists drilled into stone, right? So it's a handheld drill. Um, Michelangelo knew from looking at ancient sculptures, all artists use these drills, but ancient sculptures, in ancient sculptures, those drill holes became more pronounced because of the erosion of the surface over time. So here, Michelangelo's trying to make a work that looks like an antique. So what does he do? He puts in these pronounced drill holes. He chooses a classical subject. He shows that it's broken, right? So this is the lesson he learned from that sleeping Cupid. What did he learn? No matter how famous of an artist he ever became, his works would never be worth as much as an ancient work would. Supply and demand, right? So it's kind of interesting because not long after he makes this work, he gets commissioned to make what might have actually been the first work he could have really claimed credit for in Rome, which was, a, not this, which was an image of a pieta. So a French cardinal asked Michelangelo to make a pieta for his tomb in St. Peter's. The pieta is sort of an imagined subject where Christ's body is taken down from the cross and Mary holds him one last time and it's meant to evoke the images of the Madonna and child. It was not a very common subject in art, at least not in Italy, because it's incredibly awkward. Because the artist has to come up with a solution for how to put an adult male body onto the lap of an adult woman. So there's issues there of balance. Um, so you can see the painted solutions were not terribly satisfying. There was a sculpted tradition for the Pietà, but it tended to be German and French Gothic statues. So this is what Michelangelo is asked to do. By the way, he's 23 years old. And he's such an unknown artist that we actually have the contract for the Pietà, which is rare, but he's so unknown that he has to have Jacopo Galli cosign. Like, this guy is going to promise Michelangelo makes the statue. And this contract is one of my favorite contracts. I mean, if you can have a favorite contract, this is my favorite contract. So here, Jacopo Galli says, I, Jacopo Galli, prom the, promise the Reverend Monsignor that Michelangelo will make the work within one year and that it will be the most beautiful marble work presently in Rome and that no other present master would do it better. Bang, signed Jacopo Galli. That, it, it's a tall order, right? And so Michelangelo sets out to do this. You know, it is the only work Michelangelo will ever finish like this. He's young. It is, it is a work that is finished from God's eye view, which is incredibly rare for Michelangelo, who's known for leaving his surfaces rough. We can see his interest in anatomy, right, particularly in the body of Christ. But it was that challenge, and again, Michelangelo loves a challenge, that challenge of how he was going to make this kind of image look believable. And his solution is kind of brilliant. Um, so this is that moment, you know, okay, for, wait, first of all, I will say that he does everything he can to make Christ's body compact, right? He tips Christ's head back into sort of Mary's armpit. He's sort of circular. He keeps the legs bent at a sort of an acute angle. But the real challenge was the body of Christ should just be too big. So this is the moment where I tell my students to do crazy things in their head, but it works. And I say to all of them, okay, make Mary stand up. And they go, whoa, Mary's really big. Well, okay, but that's not a good solution for an artist. You can't just make Mary twice the size of Christ. It would be a ridiculous looking image. So Michelangelo is smart because he's thinking about the way we see things. So he knows that when you look at this statue, the focal point for you is going to be on the body of Christ. It is the focus of the pathos, right? And here, all of his interest in the anatomy is present. 
But when you're done looking at the body of Christ, you're gonna look at the face of Mary, right? Where we look for that emotional connection between the two. So if you notice, despite the fact that Mary is enormous, look at her face. Her face is small, and it's on exactly the same scale as Christ's body. So that when you look from his body to her face, there is no disparity in between the two. You don't see the discrepancy. Then you'll notice how smart he was, because he had to make her face small, but her head match her enormous body. So here you could see how he piles the drapery up on top of it in order to make those two different sets of proportions work. It was brilliant. And by the way, it was the only statue he signs. And I don't know if that's because he was young and sort of full of pride, and this was like his first big outing as an artist, or if because he really was working as a forger, and it was the first time he could say, I did it, right? <laughs> So here's the thing. We have Michelangelo who does it, who actually fills this contract and makes like the most beautiful statue in Rome. But poor Michelangelo, so poor Leonardo. Leonardo's still stuck being a court artist. Um, he was working for Ludovico, making uh, parade decorations. He was painting portraits of the ducal mistresses and painting rooms in the palace until he gets an opportunity to make um, one sort of last major work in the city of Milan, when Ludovico hires him to paint a Last Supper. Now, it's actually kind of interesting. Just like Michelangelo had this opportunity to make um, a work of a pietà, a type that existed, and sort of improve upon it, find a solution for it, Leonardo was asked to make a Last Supper for this church. Um, Last Suppers were a very common theme in Florence. Leonardo knew lots of them. They are boring compositions. Last Suppers are not exciting. Um, I know, hard to believe. But he, he would have had access to a number of these different variants that he could have seen in the city. Look, it involves putting 13 men eating around a table. Right? And your criteria as an artist is to make sure that you can identify the key players in the drama. Christ, who's almost always placed in the center. Um, St. John, who's Christ's favorite, who's so innocent, he's usually shown taking a nap, right? <laughs> usually you can find St. Peter, because of his role at the arrest of Christ, but also because he's the Pope. And then there's Judas. I love these pictures. Who could, who could the bad guy be? Who could he be? There's always one guy sitting by himself on the other side of the table, right? So they all have a certain convention. And besides that, you basically line the figures up on the other side of the table like bowling pins. And this is what Leonardo is charged with doing. And all of these pictures are in the refectories of their monasteries or convents. In other words, they're in the dining hall so that the monks and nuns could eat with Christ and his disciples. So Leonardo makes his picture. I will start by saying that it is a miracle that this thing survives. It's a miracle. Um, the church of Santa Maria della Grazie was nearly destroyed during World War II. Um, in fact, the refectory where Leonardo's painting was actually comes down, more or less. Right? You see this decoration here on the wall? That's this. And there's the Last Supper, which was only saved by sandbags, and they put a big tarp over it. They tried to move it first. It didn't work out. So this picture, it's a miracle it survives. But I'll tell you, the biggest reason it's a miracle is because of Leonardo. See, the appropriate way to paint a big picture like this is fresco painting, where you paint on a wet plaster wall with water-based paint. It's very impervious to damage over time. The problem with fresco is it required the artist to be very decisive and to work on a schedule, and Leonardo did not do those things. So Leonardo invented his own technique, and within 20 years of painting it, it was falling off the wall. So um, we've restored it about 10 times over the past few centuries, it now looks like this. The truth of it is there's hardly any paint by Leonardo left on this wall, but we can see the brilliance of his composition, and that's sort of enough for us. So we see that he follows the convention to some extent. We have to see Michelangelo, I'm sorry, we have to see Christ very prominently in the center. Um, here you could see him forming the shape of a triangle, occupying um, the central window, which shows his role within the Trinity and sort of gives him an architectural and natural halo. The other figures, rather than lining them up, he groups them into four groups of three, 
the more static groups being on the outside and getting more dynamic as you move in towards the center. So it creates a sense of rhythm towards the middle. And he puts all the figures on the other side of the table, relying instead on the subtlety of gesture to tell you who's who. The most important figures of the drama, he puts all to the right of Christ. So you see John with his downcast eyes, Peter with a knife behind his back foretelling the events of Christ's arrest, and Judas with a money bag in his hand and reaching out for food on the table. Um, by the way, there's this idea that Leonardo would actually go out and look at people and study them and try to find models for his figures. And he did that for the Last Supper, but he couldn't ever find a face good enough to be Christ or bad enough to be Judas. So the story goes. The story is he never does find a face for Christ, but for the face of Judas, he chose the likeness of the prior of the, of the church who kept torturing him to get his work done. But almost as soon as he's done painting this, um, the French capture Milan and Leonardo flees. He goes first to Venice, and at this point, it's around 1500, you realize, as like, I got like 10 minutes, uh, you realize that we haven't seen a whole lot of interaction between these two artists. Um, they've had a couple common beats in their life, their early sort of studies in Florence, their association with the Medici, the idea that they both find their early fortunes outside of the city of Florence. But in 1500, they've got one thing that comes in common for both of them, and it is the block the block. So from the earliest times when they were planning Florence Cathedral, the Florentines had this idea that they would create colossal sculptures and lift them up around the base of the buttresses surrounding the semi-domes. Um, some artists had attempted to do this in the early 15th century, including Donatello and Brunelleschi, but they kept running into problems of perspective, how to make a figure that was satisfying from way down below. None of their attempts survive. But in the 1460s, the Florentines quarried this enormous block of stone, 17 feet high, and they got it to Florence in one piece, which itself was a sort of engineering feat. And they gave it to a sculptor in the 1460s to carve, but the block was very tall and very skinny, and the sculptor abandoned the project. He's not that good. So in the 1470s, they give the block to another sculptor who works on it a little bit and abandons the project. So right around 1500, there is this idea that they're going to give away the block. And Leonardo, God love him, who never carved a piece of marble in his life, comes flying down from Milan. Because this was the sort of project of a lifetime, right? Making a colossal statue of this type. Um, Michelangelo comes home too. Um, by the way, Michelangelo comes home because of a massive guilt trip from his father. If you've ever, I mean, I've never seen anything quite like this. This is an actual letter from Michelangelo's father to Michelangelo complaining about his kids well, Michel to Michelangelo. He says, not a single one of you is in a position to help me with so much as a glass of water, though I'm now 56 years old. I have to pay for my keep and besides must cook for myself, sweep up, wash the pots and pans, bake bread, and in general, I must think of everything. Even when I have a headache, all I can do is scratch my balls. <laughs> and if God were to take away my good health, I would have to go to a hospice for there's no one to take care of me. By the way, he will live another three decades. And Michelangelo is just like him. He says he's dying from the time he's like 35 and he lives to be 88, swinging a hammer right till the end. So. They both go home, probably with the intention of getting the block. Um, cooler heads prevail, despite the fact that Leonardo is famous and revered at this point. The fact that Michelangelo just came off of this triumph of the Pietà, they give him the block, and he carves the David. And this, it's, it's, it's a progression from what we saw him do with the Bacchus. He was channeling two different traditions the Florentine tradition of the young hero David, which was a political symbol. The idea that Florence is this young, young republic, small and weak, but triumphant because they're favored by God, right? Um, and he's combining this tradition with the tradition of the Greco-Roman nude hero statue, um, the athletic, muscular male nude. Very audaciously, 
Michelangelo abandons all of the traditional markers of David. David usually has the head of Goliath by his feet. Michelangelo replaces that support with the sort of neutral tree trunk seen in antiquity. Um, he holds a sling over his shoulder, but you can't see it, especially if you couldn't walk around the back of the statue. So this was Michelangelo taking the opportunity to make a work that was purely about anatomy and antiquity. Now, something extraordinary happens when he makes the David. I will never be able to explain this. It's one of my great art historical mysteries. I hope to solve it before I die, right? And that is, when Michelangelo finishes the David in 1504, they hold a town meeting to decide where to put it. That is antithetical to everything we know about sculptors. Sculptors need to know where sculptures go, especially if it might be an object you're going to look at from 100 feet below. But somehow, when it's done, they all go, what should we do with it? So they held this town meeting. Artists came, politicians came, people weighed in. Leonardo was there. You can actually see this is a drawing Leonardo makes in his notebook, where he's sort of reimagining the David maybe into a Hercules. Um, Despite the fact that originally the thought was to put it at the church, they end up almost all agreeing that it should go somewhere near the government hall, where it would take on that political function. Oh gosh, Leonardo chooses the worst possible space that he could find for the statue. He thinks it would be best if it was there. Back there, under the loggia, where no light hits it against the wall, where he said it would be better to protect the stone. Um, listen, we don't know too much about their relationship. We do know that they didn't get along. There's a 16th century story about Leonardo walking through the streets of Florence, and he comes across a group of men discussing Dante. And Leonardo stops to talk to them, and then he sees Michelangelo walking by, and everyone thought Michelangelo was the great scholar of Dante. And so he says, hold on, hold on, Michelangelo can explain that passage to you. And Michelangelo didn't like that. He thought that he was being made fun of. So, I mean, the passage here, I'll never remember it. He yells back to him. Michelangelo says, no, explain it yourself, horse modeler that you are, who, unable to cast a statue in bronze, were forced to give up the attempt in shame. And he leaves Leonardo blushing in the streets. So it doesn't end up in that terrible spot. It gets a better location right beside the doorway. But Leonardo, so what does he do? He wanted this big showy commission. Leonardo does what Leonardo does. He probably painted or dabbled on the Mona Lisa at this point. But other than that, he made anatomical studies. He made mathematical studies, botanical illustrations, maps. He even started writing a book about how birds fly, right? But then there's this great moment in 1503, while Michelangelo is finishing up the David, the government of Florence hires Leonardo to paint in the government hall. Now, this is a big deal. I mean, we can think about this as a kind of competition between the men. Here's Michelangelo, who right now has the most important sort of political sculpture project. And so now Leonardo is getting hired to paint a picture in the same political setting, the largest picture that was then in Florence. So Leonardo gets to work. He was asked to paint a scene called the Battle of Anghiari, which was a battle between Florence and Milan from 1440. And he begins studying the composition, the horses, the dramatic faces of the men. Um, he's doing this to prepare a cartoon, a full-scale paper drawing that would map out the picture and allow him to transfer it onto the wall. Um, the cartoon doesn't survive. Um, but the best of the copies of it that exist, though probably baroquefied and exaggerated, is Peter Paul Rubens' copy that's in the Louvre. But you can see, you know, this sort of dramatic, probably the central scene in what was a much larger battle. So here's what's funny. While Leonardo is planning this picture, which he's going to put right here on this portion of the wall, the David had been finished. And you know what the Florentine government decides? why don't we just have Michelangelo paint in the very same room? You want a competition? Let's have a competition. They not only they put them in the same room, they plant them on the same wall. So Leon, Michelangelo was given this section of the wall where he was supposed to paint the Battle of Kashina, which was a battle between Florence and Pisa from the 14th century. Um, 
Of course, Michelangelo imagines it as this moment when an alarm is sounded and the men were all naked and bathing in the river and caught off guard. So they run out of the water to throw on their clothes for battle. So it's a great moment. We can see at this time this competition set up for them and each one of the men being the artist that he is. Michelangelo, who thinks of the battle scene as only this composition of muscular male nudes. Leonardo, who probably sees it as a chance to finish his equestrian thoughts, um, to sort of redeem himself, um, who imagines it as this fantastic horse battle, but full of all those things that he loved, animals and men and armor and landscape. Now, OK, the thing about this is, as soon as Leonardo starts painting, it's a disaster. Um, he writes about how the cartoon falls off the wall the minute he begins to paint. And not that long after, both of the men leave Florence. I love this, come on, it's fun. Doop. Leonardo, he goes back to Milan, um, where the French gave him an opportunity to make up for the equestrian monument by making one for them. And Michelangelo leaves and he goes to Rome where the new pope gave him the opportunity to make his tomb, which Michelangelo imagines as three story high with dozens of over life size figures. So in the end, neither man finishes what they're supposed to do. Um, Leonardo greatly upset the Florentine government who just like Ludovico Sforza was upset. They tried to get him back. They said that Leonardo comported himself like a debtor for taking all this money and not making their picture. But it's a fitting end for us, right? For the two of them, I'm going to zip through this because I know I'm out of time. It's a fitting end for us, for the two of them, that they both walk away from this challenge. And that's not because it doesn't fit what the Renaissance was. We think about the Renaissance as this great moment that likes these comparisons, painting versus sculpture, artist versus artist. But for both artists, just like the Dome of Florence Cathedral, they needed to set up a bigger challenge, something that they couldn't fulfill. For Leonardo, it's the equestrian monument. For Michelangelo, it's the chance to carve the Pope's tomb, which by the way, neither will get done either. But for us, it's a fitting end, this great ambition, which allows us to call them genius. Thank you. That was a lot. Woo. Muchas gracias. Un aplauso para la maravillosa maestra. La profesora Denise Budd de las Universidades de Colombia y de Rutgers. Hi, Denise. Hello. It's a pleasure to have you here and an honor to be working alongside you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. Está muy contenta de estar aquí con nosotros. Este, vamos a proceder a hacerle la primera pregunta a la profesora. I'm going to ask you the first question, Denise. Es la, es la que siguiente. ¿Cree usted que Leonardo se dio cuenta de que su relación con Michelangelo o Miguel Ángel no era solo una rivalidad, sino un choque de genios que marcaría la época artística más importante de la historia de la humanidad? Denise, um, do you think Leonardo realized that his relationship with Michelangelo was not, on, was not only a rivalry, but a clash of genius that would mark the greatest artistic era in human history? Well, it's hard to say what they saw about their bigger places in history at that point. Certainly, the men knew that um, they were rivals. They often worked for the same patrons. They fought for the same commissions. Um, but, and they, and they certainly knew that they didn't get along. Did they see their big place in history? Maybe. Certainly they could look back on the artists that came before them and see the impact that they made. But I don't know if either one of them would have known that the rivalry they set up then would have this kind of importance and relevance to us still today, 500 years later. Thank you. Eh, la profesora nos comenta que eh, 
no, es muy difícil saber lo que pensaban en esa época Leonardo y Miguel Ángel y que su, su rivalidad definitivamente marcó una época y que es difícil saberlo, pero saben, ellos saben que son unos grandiosos genios y que su legado será recordado y fue recordado por siglos y muchas décadas y siglos por venir. Thank you, Denise. Hi, Professor Bud. Thank you for the amazing class. It was, Thank you. It was very nice. Um, I will ask you the next question. Yo voy a estar preguntando la siguiente pregunta, que es, ¿qué importancia tuvo el trabajo de Leonardo para el desarrollo artístico y profesional de Michelangelo? So, how important was Leonardo's work for the artistic and professional development of Michelangelo? That is a very interesting question. The truth of the matter is, I don't think it was very important for the development of Michelangelo. That sounds horrible to say. But most of his early important works, which were during Michelangelo's formative years, were in Milan. And we don't know that Michelangelo was there. And then a lot of their works were contemporary. Um, some of Leonardo's most exciting and innovative work, as we said, were things that he never published. So all of these really important anatomical studies, which I think would have been very important to Michelangelo, were things that he never would have seen. And in terms of the works that he could see, they were not of Michelangelo's ilk. So even though both men were hugely influential and their paths crossed, their paths, to a large extent, were running divergently. So even though Mick Leonardo was older and had a grander reputation, I don't think he would have had that immediate of an impact on Michelangelo. Okay, thank you. Um, pues, algo muy interesante es que la profesora considera que realmente los años formativos de Michelangelo no tuvieron nada que ver con el desarrollo artístico de, de Da Vinci en esa época. Uno estaba en Milán, mientras el otro estaba en Florencia. Eh, muchas de las cosas que creó Da Vinci pues, no necesariamente eran conocidas por Michelangelo. Entonces, es difícil considerar que haya habido mucha influencia de parte de Da Vinci a Michelangelo. Thank you. La siguiente pregunta para la profesora es... ¿Qué importancia tuvo el trabajo de Leonardo? No, disculpe. ¿Cuál fue el mayor desafío que Leonardo y Miguel Ángel tuvieron que enfrentar en su época? Professor, but the next question is, what was the biggest challenge that Leonardo and Michelangelo faced in their time? Well, they faced enormous challenges in many different ways, like we all do. There were, as we've talked about some of them, real professional challenges, both in terms of working with their patrons and finishing their projects. They also faced tremendous challenges in their lives. Um, quite interestingly, given the world that we live in today, Leonardo, um, in his early years in Florence, lives through a very bad plague there in the 1470s. Then he moves to Milan and there's another plague. You know, the plague would travel from city to city and so he hits it twice in a short number of years. And the plague in Milan was one of the worst of its time. And Leonardo handles it the way that he handles every other challenge, which was that he looked at it as an opportunity. So he started developing plans for a new kind of city that would prevent the spreads of disease. So Leonardo, when he saw challenge, saw opportunity. Michelangelo faced many challenges as well in terms of the situation of his era. He would work for patrons like the Medici in Florence um, and then work against their political allies. So, Michelangelo was an artist who found himself involved in politics and wars. So, I mean, these were men who lived in really interesting times. So not only did they have the artistic challenges that we talked about, but they had the challenges of growing up in a very tumultuous time in human history. <laughs> 
Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Los, nos comenta la profesora Denise que Leonardo no solo tenía desafíos artísticos, sino también desafíos en su vida cotidiana. Vivía en un momento histórico muy difícil. Fue vividor de dos plagas diferentes. Él vivía en Milán primero, se mudó y tuvo que enfrentar otra plaga. Entonces, los, los desafíos que enfrentó Leonardo de verdad eran mucho mayores que solo sus desafíos artísticos. Y Miguel Ángel también tuvo varios eh, desafíos fuera de su esfera artística, estaba muy involucrado en las políticas, en la política pública, tratando de ayudar a todas las personas en esa época. Y esto nos demuestra que además de ser grandes artistas, eran grandes filántropos en su tiempo. Gracias. Thank you. So for the last question, para la última pregunta, esta es más subjetiva, pero es, al final, ¿quién crees de ambos artistas que tenía ma mayor talento artístico? So the last question, which is, in your opinion, who would you say had more artistic talent? <laughs> That is a really hard question. Um, I will say, in all fairness, that I am first and foremost a scholar of Leonardo. So I have a lot of bias in that direction, but I can't give you one fair answer. I can say that for the works they actually produced, Michelangelo wins. Michelangelo painted the Sistine ceiling. He put the dome on the... the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome. He, you know, sculpted the David in the Pietà. So some of the most famous works of all of history belong to Michelangelo in every medium. Leonardo, on the other hand, considering how little he painted that maybe dozen works, the fact that among them are the Last Supper and the Mona Lisa, two of the most famous paintings ever, um, says a lot about him. However, I would say for sheer output, Michelangelo produces more, produced works that lasted in a way that Leonardo never did. Who was the greater mind? I would give the greater mind to Leonardo because he understood so much about so many fields. So they're almost, they're impossible to compare. Michelangelo was the greater worker. Leonardo was the greater mind. Thank you. Yeah. Um, sí, es una pregunta difícil, es una pregunta que pusimos a la profesora, una posición complicada, pero pues Michelangelo hizo estas obras increíbles, la Capilla Sixtina, el David, pero lo que es impresionante es que Da Vinci pues hizo una docena de obras y estas también han perdurado por muchísimo tiempo, entonces la mente más brillante se tendría que ir a Da Vinci, pero puede que el talento y, y la forma de pintar y de crear y la técnica más para Michelangelo. Entonces, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you so much and thank you for having me and everybody stay safe and stay well. Have a wonderful thank, day. Thank you so much, Denise. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos. Ahora vamos a ir a un coffee break de 45 minutos. Va a tomar lugar en la explanada, por favor. Y muchas gracias a One Day University. Gracias. <laughs>